We're, uh, we're at the start of a new sermon series, and uh, I hope you're as excited as I am. <laughs> um, and uh, it's called Fishing for Jesus, and uh, we've got some props over here, um, getting into the whole fishing, fishing thing over here, um, but, but I must tell you the truth, this is actually, um, this is not a real fishing net, this is a volleyball net, <laughs> and uh, that over there is not a fishing boy, it's a Pilates ball. Um, compliments of Stefan and Venora. Um, but, but we're getting into the, the whole fishing uh, thing. I was tempted to get a bit of a fish smell going in here, but I couldn't get that one past my wife. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going on a new journey, and uh, it's, uh, it's very exciting. I really, I really believe the Lord is leading us um, into, this, into this new season of, um, like I said last week, of where we've been focusing for a while on the state of our hearts, the the, the kind of the reconstruction of our hearts. And now I believe He wants us to start focusing on, on our hands and our feet and our mouths and, uh, and, and, to, and to take on that, um, that, uh, that outward focus. Now, no fishing series or sermon series is worth its salt without a few fish tales or uh, uh, fishing stories. Would you agree? I mean, s- stories go with fishing. Don't you, don't you agree? I mean, the one that was... The, the, the fish that get away. So we're going we're gonna to start with one or two stories. It's the, the story of my first fish that I caught. I think there's a, a picture of me. I'm about, I'm probably about eight or nine, judging by, I've only got two big teeth over there. Can you see? And the, the rest are tiny little teeth. Um, so William's about seven years old. So I think I'm still like maybe a year or two older than him. And the story here goes that we as a family, uh, we used to go on holiday to, to Port Elizabeth uh, each year in December. I think it was it was Graham that said about two weeks ago that he went on honeymoon in Port Elizabeth. I was like, yeah, man, P.E., yo, lack of done. So for 20, 25 years, it's not, it's not the place where most people go on holiday, but we went there on holiday, and I, uh, because I'm quite sentimental, I'm starting to drag my family there every two or three years. Um, but we used to go as a family uh, to Port Elizabeth uh, each year, and we it was like we also at lager saam getrek. Each, each family member, they were three daughters. They all brought their caravan with their husbands and their kids. It was like this whole kind of voortrekker get-together, for a, for a lack of a, of a better word. Although we weren't voortrekkers, but it was like that. And we'd, we'd kind of get together and we'd like pry a lot of things and swim a lot and eat a lot of ice cream. But the other thing that we'd do is we'd go and catch fish. And uh, my grandfather, he was, he was a legendary hunter and, and fisherman. Anything he could, he could catch, he got excited about. And so he used to take us, I remember waking up early in the mornings, um, kind of like 5 o'clock, 4.30, get up, and then we'd drive out uh, to, to kind, of a, a, a kind of a place there where there was, it was known where it was called the wild side. And there were a lot of, lot of fishermen that used to go there in the mornings. And you kind of get out on the rocks as the sun was, was starting to rise and... Um, as a seven or eight year old boy, this was very, very exciting. I was going fist fang with Opa. And I was, man, that's as good as life got back then. Um, and uh, so we'd, I remember this, this, this one occasion. It was, I'd been practicing. I'd been practicing my, my what is it, the cost. Cost. So, so they used to have a farm. And so in December, we'd first go to the farm and uh, go and spend like a two, two or three weeks there. Or two weeks. And then we'd go down uh, to, to the coast. And there in the middle of the Karoo, where there are no fish, I would practice my cast with my, my sinker. And uh, then my opa would judge, how are we doing with cast? Gaan ons nou vis vang of gaan ons nie vis vang nie? And so I had the opportunity to, to go and catch fish there in P. And one of the first times that I, that I ever went out with them, I mean, I couldn't even, to where the fish were, I couldn't even get it out there. So my opa used to like throw it in for me and then I'd stand there. But like there were a whole lot of, I don't want to call them commercial fishermen. They were also recreational, but they were a bit more serious. It was like they needed those fish to kind of feed their families. So they were, they were on a whole new level of uh, fishing seriousness, if I can put it that way. I was like just, you know, just enjoying this uh, with my opa. And this morning, I, don't, I kid you not, you can't go and ask my opa now because he's passed away. But I don't know. If, if, just take my word for it. This morning, this is a true story. He would throw the, the thing in and nobody was catching fish this morning, that morning. And for some reason, my rod started catching fish. And uh, he, he would throw it in and the thing would strike. And I mean, my technique was terrible. I would... 
over the place and and uh, and the fish came in one for one and it was these little elf they called elf or shad fish lovely lovely fish and uh, and you know I would get so excited I'm not even looking at the fish I'm just looking at my rod and I'm turning this thing and then this fish would kind of fly through the guys over here you know somebody would catch the fish and they'd put it in and then my opa would line it up and he'd throw it out again and here and there another guy would you know get a bite here and there but then my my rod would strike again and I think that morning I caught three of these elf and eventually I could sense that these other guys were getting uncomfortable with this little boy that uh, was were, were pulling these fish out and they weren't catching anything but the best part of this whole story is we would take those fish and we chase back to the caravan and there at the caravan we had this lady that used to come camping with us a, a servant lady and man she was like before master chef she was the original master chef okay <laughs> And she, her speciality was like fresh fish. And she would like put on this nice little like batter with a bit of curry in or something like that. You know, just like, just, and she'd fry the perfect, perfect fish. And then you would, you would eat your catch there. And I just remember growing up with this, this kind of this amazing memories um, of catching fish and eating fish. Now I'm speaking about catching fish. Ladies, you know, your earliest memory might be of frying a fish. So we obviously need to make this a... a <laughs> A thing that applies to the men and the women. So I, I, I realize that going with this whole fishing for Jesus thing might be a bit guy focused or uh, a men biased. But so just think of like frying that fish or, or doing something uh, with a fish. Just not any fist clapper for the husbands because that would be bad. Um, so let's go to our next, next story. So this is the day that it got away. Okay, this is the day I didn't catch a fish. Now, the story behind this photo and the reason for my hand in the air like this is because this is the day my brother caught a fish and I didn't catch a fish. So comes the big photo moment. And I'm like, Pa, get your fish gefang me. He's like, don't worry, boy. Just pretend you're holding a fish and hold it like this. I'm like, who does that to their children? Don't they know they'll grow up one day and they'll say, Dad, why am I doing this? <laughs> anyway, it didn't seem to bother me much that day because I'm still smiling pretty big there. Uh, but that's the day that the fish got away uh, or eluded me. And my brother got a fish. Um, and so the fishing stories go. And then one more special one. There's my son, William. In March this year with his first little fish. I must say, Stefan had to help me quite a bit. Yeah, I didn't have any gear, so uh, he helped us with the, with the rods and the bait and the, and the place where, where to cast. But what an exciting experience to, to be there when your son kind of pulls out the first fish. And uh, we, uh, th this is one of those fish that you, you couldn't take back. And it's like we were camping together and he, he had to throw it back in the dam. He was highly disgusted. I promised him at the end of this year, at the end of this year, we're going fishing, and those fish he can keep. Um, so, yeah, some fishing stories that, um, that are special to me. But anyway, enough about fishing stories. Let's, let's talk about the Bible. Um, so let's go to our first scripture uh, this morning. It's from Matthew 4, verse 18. It says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And so... The context here is um, we're pretty early on in the Gospels, and uh, we've just read that um, Jesus has actually just left Nazareth, kind of where he spent a lot of time, I would imagine, quite a bit of his upbringing, and he goes to Capernaum, which is near the Lake of Galilee. So Capernaum is fishing country. So if you look where Nazareth is, it's kind of in the hills there, kind of in the north, northwest of, of the kind of the Israel area. And he kind of goes down to, to the lake there. And so I would imagine um, Jesus the carpenter has kind of been, been growing up in, in an area that's perhaps fishing is not the main thing that you do over the weekend. You know, it's, I, 
I don't know what you did in Nazareth. But, but in any case, you, he goes down to, to Galilee and he starts his ministry. And I would imagine up until then, you know, um, we don't really know much what, what Jesus did. But he kind of introduces his ministry with these words, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he starts saying those words in this area around this lake. Uh, of Galilee, and I would imagine maybe he did a couple of sermons on him by himself, and he did some ministry by himself, but then Jesus steps into the next phase of his life, and he starts looking for the team that would do this amazing ministry with him. And I found myself asking the question, where would you go if you arguably, arguably the most influential leader that this world has ever known? Where would you go and look for that team that they would later write about, that these are the planet shakers, these are the, pe the people that have literally turned the world upside down? Where as, as a leader, where as, as kind of that leader, the CEO of that team, where would you go and pick that team? Where would you go and look for those people that would go on this journey with you? And I must tell you, my first thought, if I was in Israel at that time, I'd kind of go to the Harvards of Israel that in that day, and I'd go and look for the future Zuckerbergs, I'd go and look for the Bill Gates, the Elon Musks, the movers and the shakers that I know, that is logically the path that they would follow to greatness. That, was, that would be the path that, that would easily cause them to land up in the newspapers of that day. And yet Jesus does not go there. Jesus goes to the fishing docks. And he goes to the uneducated. And for me, that would be completely counter-instinctual. I'd, I'd, I'd definitely not go down to the people that can't read and write, perhaps. I, I don't think I would go there. I, I'd go and look other places for my team, for the team that I need to build. And yet Jesus goes down to the docks, goes to the people that have arguably got a reputation for being foul-mouthed and perhaps spending their money on, on dubious activities, you know, when they come back to shore. That's not the place where I'd go and pick the team that, in a sense, would save the world and write so much of the Bible. And again, I found myself asking the question, why did Jesus go to the fishing docks to go and pick his team? And I think there are many reasons, but I think one of the reasons why he went to the docks to pick the team that he needed. And the reason is they knew how to catch something. They knew how to catch something. And where Jesus was going, there was a lot of catching involved. It was just different catching. And so he knows this. He knows that these people arguably don't know too much about the gospel. Perhaps they've never even preached before. And later on when we pick up the story in Acts it's clear that they weren't really educated because the Pharisees and the Sadducees, like I said last week, they also picked up that these are uneducated men. And so they marveled. They marveled because something else was on them. Something else was operating. There was, there was something supernatural involved on the natural year. And so let it be a lesson to us that when you think that God needs our perfect to change the world, I don't think Jesus began with perfect. He didn't go to the capital city of the country. He didn't go down to Jerusalem where the big cities were, where the thriving industries were. He goes to a sleepy little hollow in the north of the country in a little fishing village where the people's education is not amazing. And he picks the future game changers, the future world leaders in terms of the gospel from the docks and around the lake of that area. So if you go to our, our next slide, we're going to be spending quite a little a bit of time around Matthew 4, 19. He said to them, follow me. I will make you. Everyone say, make you. Make you. I will make you fishers of men. And so what we see is Jesus observing and being quite clear around the fact that these guys are not ready to do what they need to do. But he says, just leave those nets, follow me, and something's going to happen. I'm going to make you into something. 
And so this is this journey that I believe the Lord, in a sense, wants us to go on. The fact that I think if I had to ask for a raise of hands here, who's ready to go and catch some men and women for Jesus? I, I think there'd be a few, a few people. But I think most of us would kind of feel like people that are completely in a different profession. It's like, just, just leave me. Let me do my spreadsheets. Let me run my business. Let me teach kids. I'm good at that, you know. Lord, don't, don't get me, you know, uncomfortable out of my comfort zones and, and preaching for you. And yet I believe the Lord wants us to take us on a journey of making us fishers of men and women. So how do you become a fisher of men and women? Well, firstly, we go to our next one, with patience, okay? In South Africa, we've got an Afrikaans term called hengel. Does anyone know what it means to hengel? Okay, that's pretty much when you, you go and fish because it's lacquer, but you don't necessarily have to catch anything. You just go because you enjoy the process. And uh, normally there are a few cold ones involved as well. That's not cold fish. Um, but uh, it's, it's an enjoy, enjoyable pastime, and people, you know, they really get into it. Um, and so what I've realized about fishing, the little bit that I've been exposed to it, is that it definitely involves amount, an amount of waiting. Need to go to that next one there quickly. Okay. I think that sums it up, you know. And so often when we think of fishing or hunting, we think of the prize, we think of the trophy, kind of the, the kudu horns against, you know, the wall. But to get that, to get that fish or to get that buck, it's, it's, it's a process, man. You've got to stalk that thing up. You know, in the old days, you used to stalk them for a couple of days, you know, and, 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 and chase this thing. And, and the, it involved the whole process of being patient and waiting for the right moment. And at the right moment, doing the right things. And so it is with fishing as well. Those that have, that have fished before, you know, you, you kind of throw in your... your, your your ass, ne? And, your, and your, your bait, you'd throw it in there and you'd kind of wait and you'd wait. And sometimes you'd wait and you'd wait and then you'd wait a little bit more and then you'd be wondering, well, you know, is this actually worth it? I, I could be doing, I could be watching the rugby on TV, you know? And, uh, and then there's this amount of waiting involved and all of a sudden the tip of the rod goes like this. And then everything changes because then the game is on. Then the, the kind of the, the chase is on and you're like thinking, is it going to bite? Is it nibbling? Where is it nibbling? Is it nibbling just the bread off the, the hook? Where is, is it going to bite? And then sometimes you feel the strike and then we get a bit overexcited. And we kind of yank the thing and you yank the thing completely out of its mouth and it all starts again. And you feel a little bit like that boy. It's like, is this really worth it? And so we're talking about catching fish. We're talking about catching men and women, and sometimes when you go and look for men and women, you're also going to ask yourself, man, is this worth it? Is this worth all the effort, all the prayer, all the intercession? They just won't choose Jesus. I've been praying for that family member for five years, and they're so stubborn. And every time it ends up in a fight when we talk about the Lord, and yet God says to you, go back. Put it in the water. And wait for me. Wait for the right time. Fishing, people, is, you will read, how many accounts of, the, of, of Peter and John and the other disciples going out? They fish all night. They lose eight hours sleep. They catch nothing. At times I'm wondering if these guys were really bad fishermen and like you, you're tempted to think, should they have not done something else with their lives? But that's fishing. Sometimes you go, the fish just aren't there. And so when sometimes we're going to preach the gospel, you're going to want to have lots of strikes and a lot of kind of percentage-wise, you want a lot of results for the investment, for the time that you're putting into your effort. And sometimes this process of patience is called relationship. And you're just going to have to build relationship with the people that you're trying to reach. So number one, fishing involves patience. Okay, number two, we will make mistakes. We will make mistakes. The reason why I've got a hook up there is uh, I need to tell you a little story of, of when I tried to, to go fishing. And it was also close to, to when... Uh, 
when uh, when I was fishing with my grandfather, and uh, and so I put the rod in, and uh, I was trying to to reel it back in again. And okay, we just got a bit of distraction there. Thanks, Grace. And so I I thrown the the hook in. The fish had eaten the 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 bait off, and this hook came back with the sinker. And again, with with my wonderful technique, this thing came flying, and it lodged into my grandfather's calf over here. Okay, and there was like this st- silent stun, like ooh, you know, on the rocks. It's like, what can he open now, I remember my grandfather. He kind of looked down at his leg, and he, he kind of removed it out of his leg, and he said, "This all right, my sienki." <laughs> <laughs> Never forget that. It's all right, my sinky. So sometimes we will make mistakes when we are rookie fishermen. And sometimes when we get ex- saved, we're so excited and, and uh, we run out there and, man, we are, you know, just trying to, to get things going for the Lord. And then we often make the mistakes and we'll say stuff that we don't, what do we not mean to say? And we, we will do things that we're not meant to do. And, and the Lord is patient with us, you know, and He's patient and he, He's gracious with us. And so sometimes we will make mistakes. But I want to encourage you that as we go on this journey of the Lord making us fishers of men and women, don't be too hard on yourself. You will make mistakes. The Lord has grace for my, my, your mistakes. If my grandfather, who's a carnal man, who's an earthly man, can have patience with me putting a full-on sing- uh, hook in his leg and says, all right, my sinky, you know, God would be the same with us. And he's going to take us on a journey of being patient with us. We will make mistakes as we go on this journey. The third lesson I want us to learn is knowing your gear. Okay? So now, ladies, you've got to stay with me. And now it's going to get slightly technical, okay? We'll talk about frying fish just now again. But just for a moment, you, we need to go into a bit of a, a gear discussion, Okay? Bit of a technical discussion. Now, fishing fishing can get really, really technical, especially when you start going into freshwater fishing. Okay, so just for those people that feel like they need to read Fishing for Dummies, okay? There's a difference between fishing in the sea and fishing in freshwater. The fish are different. They behave differently. But more importantly, you need different equipment to catch fish in the ocean and fish in the rivers. Okay, everybody's got that. Now, there was this movie called A River Runs Through It. Okay, so the oldies here yeah, will know about it. The young people just be gracious to us. Okay, so there's this movie with Brad Pitt in called The River Runs Through It. And it was a fish, it was a movie about fly fishing. And I think they were out there in Montana. Or they were like big fishing country in the States. Man, and this movie hit the, the, the big screen. And about two weeks later, Everywhere I went, it's like people were just like on their lawns and they're like, they, they're doing what, what Brad Pitt is doing. They're practicing their fly fishing. And I remember I was a first year student and I'm on the lawns of the res that I was there in Stellenbosch, there in Volkhanov, man. And I'm, I'm, I'm just practicing and I'm like just imagining doing what Brad Pitt did and like trying to keep my fly in. The, the, the fly is the little thing on the end and it's, it must go in the air, but it must go with a specific technique. So fishing. Like this becomes highly technical, okay? To take it a step further, there's a society that you can join, okay? Now, what I'm about to say, people, your past is not swearing. This is a true fishing term. It's called the Cape Piscatorial Society, okay? It, I, I kid you not, I would never swear in the church. It's called the Cape Piscatorial Society, and it's the fly fishing society of the Cape, okay? Now, what you can do is you can join the society. And, uh, and then you go and you book certain parts of the river. So if you go through the tunnel there, there where you're going from Paul to Wooster, just to the right, if you go up into the mountains, there are amazing rivers, okay? And, and what, they, what they call it is you book a beat, okay? So a part of the river is called a beat, and you actually book that, and then you go and fish 
this thing, but it's, it's like got bushes on one side and bushes on the other side. So, so like you really have to like keep this thing going straight like this. And then there are currents involved and shadows and rocks and everything. It gets highly technical. Now sometimes fishing for men and women will involve a certain amount of expertise. And gear will come into play and you'll need the right rod for the right river. And the right fly for the right fish. And you'll need the right toolbox with the right equipment in. And, and so sometimes fishing gets technical. And the Lord said He's going to make us fishers of men and women. And sometimes you're actually going to have to go and do a bit of hard work and equip yourself and get some skills and get the right equipment to catch the right fish. I remember sitting on a plane in about two years ago and, um, and I'm starting to meditate on these fishing scriptures. And the Lord is speaking to me about this thing of becoming a fisherman. I said, Lord, you really need to break this open for me. And I'm meditating on these scriptures, sitting in the plane, waiting for my meal. And normally they come to you and the, the air hostess asks, chicken or beef? Okay. For some weird reason, this evening, there's an evening flight. She comes and says, beef or fish? I'm like, fish, thank you. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Reading about fishy, and then out of the blue, they offer me fish. I think it was Emirates, uh, Steve. Um, anyway, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like munching on my piece of fish, and it's really good fish. It's a nice little fillet of fish there. I'm reading my fish scriptures, and I decide to read the in-flight magazine, and lo and behold, one of the main articles is a fishing article. I'm like, Lord, you're speaking to me. This is amazing. I'm eating fish, reading about fish, meditating on my fish scriptures. And I'm like, Lord, one day I'm going to become a fisher of men for you. And he says, you're starting right now. And uh, he says, how about it? Drop the line here next to you. I've told you this story before. And uh, there's this guy. And that's, that's like my worst nightmare. Lord, just I don't want to talk. Just I, I just want to watch the movie, okay? Or listen to some music. Just don't make me speak to the person on the plane. I, I'm not a plane talker, speaker person, okay? So I feel the Lord speaking to me. The Holy Spirit starts, you know, stirring in my heart. And, uh, and I drop the line next to me. So, how are you doing? And uh, the awkward, he's like, oh, I have a talker next to me. And I, I think he was imagining that... Uh, he didn't want to, he didn't want to, he didn't want to speak to, speak to the person uh, next to him. And so I start speaking to, to the guy next to me and I, I start asking him, so, so, so what do you do? And he says, he's a chemical engineer and uh, it's, a, it's a young black guy and, uh, and we start talking about engineering and I ask him where he works and he's, he's kind of an up and coming guy in one of the, the companies there. And uh, and I we start ask I start asking him out uh, about what he what he's uh, you know busy with and and what he's involved with and uh, and we get this kind of awkward conversation you know kind of rolling and eventually <sighs> I throw th throw the big one in there so so what do you believe and uh, so he says I believe in science I was like oh okay Th tell me about that and we start having this conversation, and I'm caught totally off guard just by where this guy is intellectually. You know, I, I, I don't know what I expected, but I wasn't ready for that conversation. And all of a sudden, the hunter becomes the hunted, and he starts asking me questions about my faith. And I'm, I, I kind of find myself stumbling over words, and, and, I'm, and I'm in this awkward conversation, and I realized in this moment that the fish that I tried to catch... I certainly didn't have the right rod for that fish. I had no idea of the, of, of the fly that I needed to put on the end of that rod. And I found myself in waters that I probably didn't have the boat for or the toolbox for. And I remember, remember sitting there and I was like, Lord, let this never happen to me again. Let me never be kind of found out of my depth yet. It felt slightly embarrassing, I must tell you. Because we are having this 
really highly intellectual, scientific conversation. And I didn't have the worldviews. I didn't know his worldviews. I didn't know where he came from. And, and so I didn't have the arguments to kind of debunk his theories. But with a little bit of effort and a little bit of equipping and a little bit of reading and a, a, perhaps a seminar or three, I could have had a meaningful conversation and at least challenged him around what he believes. And so sometimes when you go fishing for men and women, you will need the right rod for the right river. You will need to know your gear. You will need to equip yourself. And so people, where we are going in the next few months, there's some equipping that's going to take place. Man, you look excited about that. <laughs> Is anybody ready to fish for Jesus here? Okay, I've got about three people. Wonderful. By the end of the sermon, we might be up to five. Okay, let's go to our next, next slide there. Fishing is also a team sport, okay? Fishing is a team sport. We read here in Luke 10. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also. That word also is important. And sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among the wolves. And so Jesus has been walking this road with these, these 12 disciples, those that he called to himself, and he built into them, he built relationship with them, and he showed them and modeled a whole lot of things. And at some point, he expands the group. And he expands it to about 70 people, and he sends them out two by two. You see, sometimes when you go fishing by yourself, Sometimes it's not the right word. When you go fishing by yourself and you've got one rod in the water, I haven't heard of a fisherman that caught two fish at the same time. Okay, Perhaps you have. But I certainly have not heard or seen that or experienced that myself. However, when you go in partnership with somebody and you perhaps hire a boat, like we did when we went to Port Elizabeth one year. I'll digress just for one minute. One year, my dad thought it's, 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 it'd be an exciting family experience to go deep sea fishing. I've shared this, I think, a long time ago as well. And uh, the kids were like, deep sea fishing, you know, let's go. And we, we booked this trawler. I don't know what we were expecting, perhaps the QE2 or the Titanic luxury or something. But it's like this petrol diesel thing that smelled like, I don't know, it was like... You know, it, yeah, it was, I don't even know if it was legal. Anyway, we, we were just hoping the thing would come back if we went out to see in it. But anyway, we, we booked this thing and we go out on this boat. And I, sh I shared this last time, but uh, man, we're all like bright eyed and ready for this whole deep sea fishing experience. We are going to eat so much fish. It's not even funny. And uh, we start going out the harbor and that morning the waves were there and this, this, this boat starts doing this. And uh, I shared this with you last time. About five minutes into my fishing experience, which was due to, to last from about four o'clock in the morning till about three o'clock the next afternoon. About five minutes into this experience, I start feeling a serious discomfort in my abdomen. And uh, I'm like, hey, what's, what's going on here? And uh, about five minutes after that, the first um, projectile came and uh and about a half an hour later i'm it's not like i'm even on the floorboards because this boat doesn't have floorboards it's got corrugated iron with bolts that stick up like this but it felt like a silly posturepedic to me because i was just like i was just hugging my stomach and roaring like a lion and eventually there was obviously no nothing else coming out um and so this whole deep sea fishing experience of you know going fishing with my family Turned out, turned out pretty nasty. But the point is that day we caught a lot of fish. Okay, well, at least the other people did. So when you go fishing with other people and you go in a boat and there's nets and stuff and gear involved, the catch becomes exponentially bigger. And so this is what we're talking about this morning. And that's why I believe Jesus at some stage said, okay, now I'm going to send you out more of you. I'm going to send 70 out of you. You're going to go two by two that you can cover each other back. Because where I'm sending you, it's like lambs that are going out among the wolves. And you're going to have tough conversations. 
And sometimes it's going to feel like people just are biting your head off and they want to devour you for what you believe. And so fishing very much is a team sport. And so when we go fishing at a ch- as a church, yes, you will have those individual conversations with the people around you. You will have those one-on-ones. But we will also go fishing as a team, as a church. The second last one, fishing is often a place where you go in dangerous waters. Has anybody seen deadliest catch? Okay, three people. Okay, so you, there's this program, okay, on, or oh, I don't even know if it's going anymore. It used to, used to go, and it's, it's, it's about these group of fishermen that go fish crab, king crab in the Bering Sea, and kind of way up there. And I've got to read this for you because it's, it's hectic. Um, the conditions that they're fishing. It says... Commercial fishing has long been considered one of the most dangerous jobs in America. In 2006, the Bureau of Labor Statistics ranked commercial fishing as the job occupation with the highest fatality rate, with almost 75% that of the rate of pilots, flight engineers, and loggers, the next most hazardous occupation. Okay, so 75% higher than the next most hazardous occupations. However, Alaskan king crab fishing is considered even more dangerous than the average commercial fishing job due to the conditions on the Bering Sea. According to the pilot episode, death rate during the main crab season averages nearly one fisherman a week. While the injury rate, listen to this, while the injury rate for crews on most crab boats is nearly 100%, due to the severe weather conditions, such as frigid gales, rogue waves, ice formations, and just life on the boat. There are people that actually do this for a living. But they are aware of the risks they are involved with when they go commercial fishing. But when they go Alaskan king crab fishing, they know that once a week they put somebody in a body bag. Dangerous, dangerous waters. And fishing for men and women sometimes is also like this. I don't think we know of the price that certain Christians pay to share the gospel. The places that they are aware or willing to go into. I was sitting to next to Benjamin yesterday. He's a French guy who was sitting at Ilani and JP's wedding year. Benjamin's a French guy, a young guy. And uh, when he was 15, the Lord spoke to him. He says, I want to use you one day in the Middle East. So he grew up in Paris, just outside Paris, and and he went straight off to school and he went and equipped himself, I think, with a, a BA degree kind of in, in, in Islamic studies. And eventually went on to study a master's degree in understanding the Middle, Middle East and, 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 and Islam, Islamic studies. And Benjamin is now currently based at the Marmesbury Church, so far Marmesbury. And he's got two young little kids now. And they're just about to go, I think it's tomorrow, they're going into Somaliland and, and Somalia, there where the pirates are, into the most hostile place, I would say one of the most hostile places in Africa to go and share the gospel. And sometimes they'll go in there for months without even saying the word Jesus because if the community starts hearing that you're sharing about Jesus, I mean, you guys, we, we read the newspapers, we hear the headlines of Boko Haram and these, these militant groups. The price that you pay for sharing the gospel, those are dangerous seas to go fishing in. Yet there are people like him. Married an Afrikaans girl here from Marmesbury. That's what they do. They go and live for Jesus where the cost is high, where the death rate, spiritually speaking, is high. There are many people like that see us goes into Pakistan Bombs are going off where he is. He gets a warning, gets a dream. You need to move out of this venue. Gets all these people. I says, we need to move right now. As they're going down, they drive past guys in a 4x4 AKs. You heard later they were coming for them in the house. There's some people that go fishing in dangerous seas. I'm not saying we're all called to go there, but there are some people that go there. Sometimes fishing for Jesus is not what we think it is. It's not that leisurely holiday experience. 
Sometimes the cost is high. I'm just kind of putting it out there and kind of the, the realities of, of the full spectrum of, of, of fishing for the Lord. The last one, on a slightly lighter note, remember to have fun, okay? I found this picture, just this toothless fisherman. Man, he's just brilliant. We went, took the kids to the aquarium uh, a while back, and uh, there's just this picture of this guy, and it's just this moment. I don't know what joke they cracked, but man, he's laughing his head off. And, and so we're going to have a lot of fun, you know, all this fishing stuff. We're going to have a lot of fun, people. We're gonna, the, the, you're going to see there's, there's a joy in going. There's a, jo- a joy in sharing the gospel. There's a joy in prepping the nets. There's a joy in casting the, 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 the lines together. And so I'm very excited for the journey that the Lord is going to take us on. I'm going to close with this scripture. And I've got the little picture up there, Luke 5, verse 1 to 11. This is a, a picture from our children's Bible. And this is how the illustrator interpreted this story, Luke 5, 1 to 11, okay? It's uh, the abundance of fish. I would imagine that's Peter there on the left-hand side, John on the right-hand side. And uh, they, they've caught a lot of fish, okay? Our kids always get excited. They try and count these fish, okay? But, but this is the story that I'm about to read to you. And there's a twist in that little picture, okay? Luke chapter 5. Now, so it was, as the multitude pressed about him, Jesus, to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gethsemane and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. Now when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. When they had done this, they caught a great multitude of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had just taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. And so it's a well-known part of Scripture And it's also kind of at the beginning of Luke's account of the Jesus story of the gospel. So if you can kind of read before that and afterwards, it's quite similar to what we read in Matthew. This is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It's also up there in, in Galilee. And so Jesus kind of walking around. He must have built up a bit of a reputation because the multitudes were around at this occasion. And... He starts teaching them. In fact, what he does is he gets into one of the fishermen's boats. I don't think he asked him permission because it doesn't say that. I I can just imagine Peter was kind of washing his nets there on the side. And all of a sudden, he might have heard of this teacher called Jesus. And there are a lot of people around. But all of a sudden, the teacher gets into the boat. And maybe Simon ran up to him and said, excuse me, that's my boat. Can I help you? Do you want to use it for the day? Or You can kind of just put yourself there. But... There's this, there's this moment where the, 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 the teacher takes the liberty of getting into a boat. And Simon gets into the boat with him. Peter gets into the boat with him. And Jesus starts teaching the multitudes from a little. He says, push out a little bit. Let's just, let's just go 30 or 40 meters into the water. And one of the reasons that they actually did that in the Old Testament is because sound travels really well over water. And so he would speak and the sound would kind of bounce off the water. And it could kind of amplify the noise to the crowd that he was teaching. And so we have this moment, this kind of this engagement between Jesus and these people that he's teaching. And then there's this, this kind of this interjection, this, this thing that doesn't make sense, which we often read about in the Bible. Is 
When he had finished teaching the people, he turned to Simon and said, go, let's go out and go catch some fish. And what amazes me is we don't know what he said to all those people. I would imagine if I was the teacher, I'd be worried about, I've just spoken to these people. I'll just minister to these people. Maybe there are needs. Maybe there are the people that need healing. Maybe that the people we should be ministering to. If it was 2018, we'd need to get the numbers for the database. We'd, we'd kind of, you know, we'd need to engage the people. That's what this all is about. And yet, it's as if Jesus turns to Simon, he forgets about all the people, and he says, I want to have a conversation with you. Let's go fishing. And Simon says, Lord, I'm really tired. We've been fishing all night. The fish are not biting. And you imagine what goes through Simon's man. Here's the carpenter from Nazareth telling the fisherman that's been fishing since he's a lighty that we need to go fish now. And yet Simon says, okay, Lord, at your will. I don't know what was going on in his heart and his mind. He's like, man, this sounds crazy. You know, I, I really just want to go home and sleep and forget about a bad day at the office. And here's this guy that... It looks like, I mean, I think a fisherman would know another fisherman. This guy, he's not a fisherman. He's telling me to go fish. But he knows it's, he knows it's Jesus. I don't think Jesus is that famous yet because Simon and, and, the, and the, 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 the apostles, the, the, the disciples get called off. So I don't really think he's got like this aura around Jesus or this like, man, this is a man of massive reputation. He says, okay, okay, let, let's try this. And so they go out. And Jesus tells them where to fish. Throw the net in here. And what happens next does not result in that picture over there. Joy and happiness. When they catch so much fish that they have to signal to the other disciples to come and help and both boats, boats start sinking the carpenter starts blowing all the commercial fishing records out the water, and their, their result, their, their experience is not one of joy. The Bible lets us in. It's one of fear. It's one of awe. It's one of reverence. Because the hardened fishermen know what's just gone down. They know this is not natural. You don't catch so much fish that both boats start sinking from what we're doing. We've been fishing these waters all our lives. This is not normal. And so they are, the word says, astonished. They are astonished. And Peter's result is not jumping up and down for the great catch. He falls down in fear and he says, depart from me. I'm not meant to be here. I'm a sinful man. And so Jesus' words to him is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Follow me. I will make you fishes of men. From now on, you will catch men. And so this morning, as we, as we close, can we stand? I've got one or two questions I want to ask you. You see, the story doesn't stop there. These men that knew nothing about catching women and men for Jesus, they go on a journey. They respond that day. And they leave what is comfortable. They leave what they know. And their lives change radically. And three years later, we find a different Peter, a different John, a different James, a different Andrew, a different Philip. And now they're in the news headlines, not for fish, for other things. For what they're saying, for what they're doing, for the power that's manifesting in their lives. As they take this thing called the gospel to the world. 
We spent a whole Sunday last week talking about that day when power arrived on the scene. And Peter, with a new boldness, preached the gospel. And the result was, there was some serious fishing going on. I shared those numbers with you last week. In one service, one altar call, 3,000 people come to the Lord. That's a big catch. And so what happened in the natural three years ago was just a mirror image, just a taste of something that would happen three years later that would have significant eternal value. Peter was fishing, but he was fishing for something completely different. He was fishing for the souls of men and women. And so this is where we're going, people. This is all about people. I know I've spoken a whole lot about fish. It's just a metaphor. It's just the image. It's just something that we can relate to. It's all about people. I remember being in London two, three years ago. And we were at Waterloo Station, probably the busiest intersection, trains and trams and public transport in London. Feels like the whole world is in one little train station. And those that have been there will know what it's like. They are just teeming teams of, it's just, they're just people everywhere. All races, all colors, all nationalities. Man, if you wanted a cosmopolitan city, that's it. And just for a moment, as I was reflecting on these scriptures, it's like the Lord just opened up my eyes just for a second. As I was kind of, just as people were whizzing past in all directions, it was the Lord opened my eyes just to see them as, as just fish in this busy, busy pond where there's just stacks and stacks of fish waiting to be caught, waiting for somebody to be bold enough to go and cast their net or their line in those waters. And Frontrick is no different. This valley is no different. You will know. You will know the people that you engage with. You will know that they're waiting. They're waiting for us to become fishers of men and women. You see, catching fish and mean, catching fish and catching men and women means you need to do something. They're not, it's like Anton often says, you're not going to sit in the boat and scream, yeah, fishy, 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 come, jump in the boat. That's not how you catch fish. You actually need to do something. You need to go out there. You need to put your faith in something. You need to throw something out there and, and let, your, let your nets down. Sometimes you're going to wait. You're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to build relationship. You're going to have to go little for little, sharing a bit of your life, investing until it's time to lift that rod and make the strike. You'll need partners. You'll need to go as teams. We'll go in the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord will be our strength. Most of all, this morning, I feel if you're a little bit like me and you're not a natural fisherman for Jesus, okay? You will rather stay in the church in the little fish pond where it's safe and predictable. That the Lord is making a commitment the same way that He did to His disciples. And He's saying, just like I made them into something. I made them from fishes of fish to fishes of men and women. I believe the Lord wants to take us on that journey of making us a church that fish for men and women. And so, in conclusion, if we go to that last slide, the Lord, I believe, is saying He will make us fishers of men and women. He will make us fishers of men and women. Secondly, He will show us where the fish are. He will show us where to throw the nets. He will show us when to throw the nets. He will show us how to throw the nets. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. So you can go fishing like Peter and John did. And then a few hours later, you can go fishing in exactly the same water. And you can have a completely different response. Because Almighty God is in your fishing. And that's why I shared what I did last week. We have the power. We have the power. Not for the sake of keeping the power, but for the sake of lives being changed. 
And so I believe this valley is waiting for us, the sons and the daughters of God, to rise up, to go and share the gospel, and to make disciples. So the question I want to leave you with this morning is, imagine Jesus walks into this church like he did with those disciples. And he says, will you leave your nets to come fishing with me? And by that, I don't mean we must all go quit our jobs and become full-time evangelists. The Lord help us. What I mean is, will you say yes to the process of being made into a fisher of men and women this morning? So as every eye is closed, I just want to pray for us this morning. Father, thank you for this challenge. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your commitment, Lord, to us. That you make us into something that we are not. God, you know, some of us naturally gravitate, Lord, to being fishers of men and women. But most of us, God, are comfortable in, in those spaces, Lord, that we know, that we're familiar with, Lord. And this morning, God, I pray for us for the boldness, Lord, to be like those disciples, to leave that which is familiar, to leave that which is predictable, Lord, and to say yes to the uncomfortable. So what I'm going to ask now is I'm going to challenge us. And I want you to be honest. I'm going to challenge us to commit to the process, to the start of becoming something, of becoming a fish, a fisherman, a fisherwoman of other people. You don't need to be the finished product yet. We're going to go on a journey together. The Lord is going to make us like He made the disciples. So if you want to be with me in that boat and say, Lord, make me a fisherman, a fisherwoman of, of your people, Lord, that need you, of all those fish that need you. Just slip up your hand quickly. I just want to pray for us there where we are. Father, I thank you, Lord, for all these hands, Lord. I thank you that you see, God, that you know, Lord, where we are all at, Father, that some of us might be like Peter, Lord, that are petrified at what this entails and I thank you that we can just speak over each other, Lord, and speak over our own lives, Lord. The words that Jesus said to Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And so, Lord, I just speak over each person here this morning. And I just nullify fear in their lives. Nullify fear of the unknown. Fear of the uncomfortable. And I just speak a word of grace over us, Lord, that we will not be afraid to catch for you, Father. God, we ask, make us fisher, fishermen and fisherwomen, Lord, of your people that need you, we ask in Jesus' name. Is, is every eye still closed? If there's somebody here this morning that does not know the Lord, that knows that right now you're one of those fish that's not in the boat of salvation. You swimming around and doing your own thing. And if you are to get into trouble and things are to go wrong for you, you know you're not guaranteed of eternally being with the one who loves your soul, who made you and who paid the price and gave his life for you. If you know that things are not right between you and the Lord this morning, if you've backslidden, you've become cold, you've become indifferent, You've started ignoring the Lord in your life. Today is an opportunity. We do this as often as possible. Today is a day of salvation for you. Today is a day of redemption for you. So as every eye is closed, I want you to be bold. If that's you, if you know you need to, this morning is for you. This is all for you.